Hey everybody, welcome back to our series on Excel for data science and we're on part five. So far we've covered tidy data, um, using functions, uh, correlation and single sample t-tests. This video is going to cover dependent t-tests, how to run them, how to interpret them, and how to graph them. So the first thing is to go back to the very first video we did, which is covering tidy data. So when you want to analyze this data, you want to make sure that each person gets their own row and each measurement or variable gets their own column. So what I've done here is just made up some fake data. We've measured people twice. So this is a dependent t-test, meaning that the sample, the variables are related. Um, so it's one sample of people that's been tested at least twice, maybe more, but you're only concerned about two of those testing times. Now, this could be two different opinions on something. It could be time one and time two. So before and after or pre-test, post-test design is really popular for dependent T. But you're using dependent T when you only want to look at two of the columns at once. You're going to switch over to repeated measures ANOVA if you want to do multiple columns. So we've got our two time measurements here. Um, and each person's their own row. So we have about 11 participants in the study. And I just want to know if there are differences between time one and time two. And so for this, you'll want to make sure you have the data analysis pack installed because you could do this by hand, but there's no reason to because the data analysis pack is actually really great for this. So far, everything we've covered has been sort of hit and miss, but now we're getting into the more popular designs or statistics, simple statistics. So that um, toolkit pack is really handy. So I'm gonna click on data and the data analysis over here because I have it installed. You'll want to come down to t-test paired to sample for means. So of all of our options here, we're focusing on the paired one. Click OK. You want to pick variable one's range. And the nice thing about having them in completely separate columns is that we can um, pick the entire column and then add data and then go back and run this again. So I'm going to pick the entire column, but you could just highlight the data you're interested in. So let's say you only wanted the first 10 participants, you could just click and highlight as well. But I'm going to just tell it to pick the whole column. I'm going to come over here and click in this box or click this button to get column two. Okay. So be sure you're clicking to change which variable range you're in. Otherwise, it'll just keep overriding variable one range. Okay, so you need numbers in both of these or it will not be happy with you. And they shouldn't be the same number. Um, hypothesized mean difference. This is where you predict what difference you would expect. The most common number here is going to be zero. But you could say, I only care if their scores go up at least one point. Or um, we know that the scores are going to go up 10. Maybe we need it to be greater than 10. So you would pick... Um, what you would expect that difference to be. Uh, most statistics courses, people teach you that this number is always zero. That's not true. You could have a specific hypothesis about maybe one point or 10 points. Um, most common number though is going to be zero. Okay, so I, any change at all is going to be useful for me. I'm going to click on labels because I do have labels and I highlight, highlighted them as part of selecting this. So if the label is in there, be sure you click on labels or I'll be mad at you for using words instead of numbers. Alpha here is your type one error rate. And most people set this to 0.05, although there's no good reason for that particular number other than precedence. And so at least in psychology, we've been talking about this a lot lately. And so this should be a number uh, of that you might uh, use as a criterion. So 0 0.05, 0 0.01, 0 0.10, 0 0.2, um, but I would tell you to think about that in the context of your field and justify the one that you're using. Okay. I'm gonna leave it at 0.05 for no other reason than it's what I normally use, but if I were to do a real study, I would have to justify why that was a good choice. Okay. And then we'll stick that in, um, into a new worksheet. Okay. Click OK. So once we get that, let's make all these columns bigger and make the font a little bigger so you can see. Here we go. Okay. 
So I can round all this stuff off um, to two decimals, but then that would make P hard to read. So I'm gonna just leave it at the like eight decimals it gives you. But these two things are really nice here because it tells me the mean for each one. And then unfortunately it gives me the variance instead of the standard deviation, which is a little obnoxious, but we can, we can convert that if we wanted to. Um, so we're definitely gonna use these means again. But in my made up data, I said that the mean for time one was 3.7 and the mean for time two is six. Okay, so we're going up by a little over two points. It gives me the variance. Be sure you're paying attention that this is variance and not standard deviation. This gives me the sample size or the number of observations. Now this output looks exactly the same as independent T. So when we cover independent T next week, I'm gonna say this again, but remember that these are the same people. And so this, it looks like there's 11 people in time one, 11 people in time two, that's true, but they're the same 11 people. So there's still only 11 people total in my study. So N or sample size here is 11, not 22. It gives me the correlation between um, measurements, which is important for repeated measures because we have to control for the fact that I have used the same people twice. It reiterates what hypothesized mean difference I picked. And then now we get into the actual stats part. So the degrees of freedom is gonna be n minus one. And so that's why it's 10 and not um, n minus one plus n minus one, like it would be for independent t. So the degrees of freedom here is only 10 because it's 11 minus one. Our t statistic is calculated by taking the mean difference of time one. So mean um, of number one, mean one minus mean two, divided by the standard error of the differences between means. And that's the reason why I said, just let Excel do the math for you. It's because this, what happens is, is it takes the time one minus time two, calculates the standard deviation on that, then calculates the standard error for that standard deviation. Um, and so you don't really have to totally understand how that works, but essentially the denominator in this T statistic is the standard error of the, the change score for participants. So that might be a better way to say it, is the standard error of the change score. Okay. So we're taking their change, time one to time two, divided by the standard error of that change. And so what you'll see across all these tests, so from single T to dependent T to independent T, it's always some form of difference on the top and error on the bottom. And so if you like cheesy YouTube videos, there's a really great one called Stats Wrap that um, talks about that exact thing. So that's part of their lyrics is that the difference on the top and the error on the bottom is how most test statistics work. So that's T for us. Um, and so we've got a negative score because it takes time one minus time two. So we got three minus six. And then I get the, the P values for those. So this is the probability of T for a one tailed test. Okay, um, and that would be one tailed on the bottom because it's negative. So the likelihood of the difference being that negative or less. Okay. Most people don't look at one tail tests unless you have a very specific direction hypothesis. Most people tend to look at two tail tests because they could go up, could go down. And so I would say that this P value, if I were writing this up, is less than 0.001. Okay. It also gives you the critical score. Critical scores are for that alpha, so 4.05. Uh, I needed a T value of at least positive or negative 2.23 for this to be uh, less than alpha. Okay. So my P value being significant. Okay. Um, another thing we could do is calculate uh, an effect size for this sort of thing. And that is calculated by taking mean one minus mean two divided by the standard deviation of the change score. Okay. And we'll get into how to do that in just a second. So all of this is like the, the t-test. So it's really easy to run. You just have to think about the interpretation. So if I was gonna write this up in APA style, I would say t with 10 degrees of freedom is negative 5.47. Okay, my p-value is less than 0.001. And I could talk about this being significant given my alpha is 0.05. What I think is more useful is talk about the effect size. 
this kind of depends on your goals. If you're just wanting to um, like talk about significance, you'd be done. But we're often really concerned about practicality. So this is significant isn't important. And so the easiest way to calculate the effect size is to actually create yourself a difference score. Okay. To do this part by hand, unfortunately, because Excel does not have this plugged in. So to create that difference score, I'm going to do equals. I'll click on A2 here, minus B2. I could flip those. So all it would do is change the sign. Remember from the first couple of videos that you would come over here, wait till this turns black, double click, and that'll give you all the different scores. Okay. And now I'm going to calculate the mean for column one so equals average. Highlight all those numbers. Open parentheses, sorry. Highlight all the numbers. Close parentheses. I can cut and paste this. So I'm going to do control C or Apple C, control V. So now I've got my two means. And then we're actually going to take the standard deviation of the different scores. Remember that's S T D E V. Open parentheses, highlight everything, close parentheses. So what I can do to calculate D, there's actually two different forms. So you're going to get, uh, there's D, I always call this D differences. Sometimes people list this as D Z because it's based on more of a traditional Z formula for um, um, statistics. And we would do mean one minus mean two, oops, divided by the standard deviation of the change scores. So we would do equals, open parentheses, one, this first mean minus, second mean, close parentheses, divided by standard deviation. And so I've got 1.64. So that's a, pr a pretty big effect size. Okay, this is how you can tell it's made up data is because that number is pretty big. And you can interpret that kind of like a z-score. So it's the number of standard deviations differences between measurement one and measurement two. Um, some people have argued, though, that that number is a little biased. It tends to be upwardly biased, meaning it's we're overestimating it. And so I've always called this the averages. And I've seen people abbreviate it DAV. Okay. On that one is mean one minus mean two divided by the standard deviation. So the average standard deviation of mean one. Um, and the standard deviation of two. Okay. So we're dividing the, the denominator in this case is the average standard deviation for one and for two. Okay. We don't have all those numbers yet, so let's calculate. So we've got equals STDEV. And we're gonna need this number in a minute anyway. So I'm gonna highlight everything, close parentheses. Remember that I can copy both of these. Uh, I can copy this first cells and it will automatically calculate now on the second cells. Okay. I don't need the average of the standard deviation because we've already done this. So what we do is we equals, open parentheses, time one minus time two, okay. divided by, now you can just do the average function again, these two numbers. So the standard deviation for one and the standard deviation for two. And we'll actually get a bigger score, which is a little unusual. So um, normally, uh, the averages is less because the the um, average of the the sorry the standard deviation for each individual column is greater than the standard deviation for the different scores. I managed to make this up where it's not, <laughs> but uh, in this particular instance, you can also see that they're gonna be different numbers. So if you're going to report an effect size, at least tell people which one you used, and you can use D subscript Z and D subscript AV, so people know which formula that you're using. Okay. If you want a reference for those two formulas, um, or those abbreviations, these are the uh, author I like to cite is Daniel uh, Likens. 2013 paper. It's an open sourced paper so that you can, um, anybody can read it. And 
Um, he just has a really good layout of like all the different types of effect sizes and um, what their formulas are, what the differences are between them. Um, he's not the original like formula creator for these, but it's a really great paper to help you sort out maybe which one you want to use. So I could report the effect size for these, um, and he will also warn you that these numbers are way too big to be real numbers. Very last thing, let's cover graphs. So I'm going to start a new sheet, and when we want to graph this, um, what I always tell people to do is just make yourself a little chart of the means. So I'm going to come back over to sheet one, copy over my means here. Oops. So an example of how referencing doesn't always follow. So paste options here, click down, values only. And that transferred over just the numbers for me. I'm also going to make a separate little chart of just the standard deviations. Now I've kept these separate in like kind of two separate little sections. Um, because otherwise people tend to, um, and when I've taught this in class, students will try to make a chart of the means and standard deviations as like a double bar graph. You don't want to do that. You want to keep these separated out so that we can use the numbers, but you don't want them to imply that I'm going to compare the mean to the standard deviation. That's not what we're doing. So copy these. This time, if you want to do it right the first time, you click the little down arrow on paste and paste values. So how to make the chart. I'm going to highlight just my means, go to insert, and this um, bar column graph here, even though I would call this a bar graph, uh, the first 2D column one. And then well, we got some love to do to this graph, right? So the base graphs in Excel are kind of ugly. I'm going to do this in APA style, but um, obviously you can edit the title. We don't have titles on ours, so I'm just get rid of it. Um, depending on the journal, you may or may not want to leave the lines. You can leave them in there. We should probably add some good axes labels, like what are the, the heck are these axes? So we'll click add chart element, axes titles. We can add a horizontal one and a vertical one. And there are lots of ways to skin a cat doing this, so, um, sorry, euphemisms. There are lots of ways to do this in Excel. I'm just showing you the ways that I find easiest. So click on the title, click again so that you can start typing. And we could say measurement time. On our title over here, we would say average score or average rating. Kind of depends on what you're doing. But either way, we've explained what both axes are. If your rating score does not actually go down to zero, because let's say this is a Likert scale and it ranges one to seven, zero is not an option. We should cut zero off. So if you double click on the axis, you'll get some options over here. I'm going to cut zero off because it's not a valid score on my scale. Click back over here. Right. I also hate Calibri, so you can highlight the entire chart. Go back to home. Change that to maybe Arial or Times New Roman. Kind of depends on what traditional levels for your journal. I'm going to click here. I have not sat at a house with a phone in a long time, but I'm recording this from Texas. Hi, from Texas. Um, and my parents' phone is randomly ringing. So no dogs today, just random phone calls. Anyways, back to the other thing. Maybe we don't want this to be blue. We can click on the little paint option. Go down to fill. And you can click no fill. Uh, that looks a little weird, so maybe a solid fill, and we can pick gray or something. Okay. Um, maybe not that color gray, because then it would be very hard to read. A little bit darker. There we go. So the very last thing I want people to add, really, is error bars. And that's why we typed these numbers in over here. So I'm going to click on the series, so I've got both of them highlighted. Go back to my chart formatting options. Add chart element, error bars. Don't pick any of these options because it will auto calculate from the means, which is not what you want. 
you want more error bar options. It's very tempting to click on standard deviation, but what that does is it calculates the standard deviation of the means, which is not what you want. You want to click more error bar options, so you have all of the control. Um, and in one of these, it gives me an option, so the little three bar one. Instead of fixed value here, we're gonna click custom, then specify value. And this is confusing because it gives you positive and negative, but we're going to highlight both of these so that I'll get the first one for the first bar and the second one for the second bar. <coughs> Click over here in the negative one and do the same thing. Highlight both of them. Okay, so they'll be the same in both, <coughs> excuse me, in both positive and negative so that it gives you an even error bar on both sides. Click OK. And you'll notice how this one got bigger. And so what's happening is now that we've done these custom is that, and let's say I change this and I realize that standard deviation actually should be 0.5. That will change that error bar so that the error bars are tied to the actual standard deviation for that data. As opposed to the options, I have to click on the error bar to see it again, as opposed to some random fixed value that isn't tied to the data or some standard deviation, um, that would, if we clicked on standard deviation here, it would give us one standard deviation of the average between the means, which is not our actual data. So when you're doing error bars, you could do two standard errors, you could do one standard error, you could do confidence interval, but either way, this custom option gives you the most control over what those values are to match your data, rather than giving Excel the control to, pay, to randomly calculate something for you. So that's my big caveat on graphs and adding error bars um, is make sure you have the control because you're the data scientist or you're the statistician. So you want those numbers to be the numbers you expect and not something auto calculated. Okay. Small rant over. The only other thing I would suggest is um, let's say you're writing this up for publication or um, you know, a report you're giving to your company, whatever. Tell people what those are. Error bars represent one standard deviation. Around the mean. Okay. So you see a big theme on our series is gonna be tell people what you're doing and you take control. So yes, it's really great that Excel calculated all these things for me and I can write them up. Um, but I wanted to make sure that if I present the data visually, which always helps people, so data viz is great, um, I have the control over what those values are. Okay. So that's our quick and dirty dependent t-tests on how to calculate them, a little bit about the effect sizes that one might calculate with them, and how to graph uh, and visualize your data to maybe put in a report. Stay tuned next week for independent t-tests.